welcome, Jennifer. We're happy to have you here as part of the Love Begins With Me film project. And our whole goal in this film project is to discuss all things about unconditional love. How it relates to us personally, how it relates to our experiences, how it relates to the world around us, and more personally, how we end up sharing unconditional love. So, I'd like to begin this discussion with you as actually asking what is your, shall we say, interpretation, definition, understanding of unconditional love? Okay, it's, a, it's, it's constantly evolving. It's, it's different all the time, but uh, you left me a question when I left you last year about do I uh, love myself unconditionally? I've been sitting in that question for over a year now. And what and, have we uh, found? <laughs> and uh, just recently I came up, okay, let, let me change the question. Let me, uh, in the world of do be haves, what we have and who we are and what we do, it's a do question. Do you? So what happens if I switch that around to um, are you? Well, then I can make the statement, I am unconditional love, and it changes the entire color of the thing. Uh, and if I am love unconditionally, which is kind of a given, because if uh, conditional love isn't love at all, but if I am, then everything that I do expresses that. So we're evaluated on um, what we have very often and what we do. That's the first question somebody will ask is, uh, what do you do? Right. And uh, rarely we'll ever get to who you are because we, that's a very hard thing to define. But if we are in substance uh, love, unconditional love, then everything that uh, we express will come out that way. In our relationship with others, in our relationship to ourself, in relationship to the planet, and uh, all activities um, and all feelings are in that energy field. So then the question would be, related with that, you personally, what would be your then understanding of this love in you? I mean, I realize we're talking about something that doesn't have a definition. And it's right, right, right. And, that's, and yet there's an experience that happens that I would say, you know, maybe a twofold way of approaching this. Have you always understood this unconditional love, or did you have previous parts of your life where you had a more limited love, and now you're actually understanding what it's like to fully embrace and fully embody unconditional love for yourself? And can you like how, yes. share how you actually come to that answer of that question from a year ago? Um, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's called sitting in the question. Don't try to go for the answer right away. Just hold on to the question as long as you, um, until yeah, uh, an answer or a thought or an idea kind of evolves from there. And even the idea of um, what unconditional love is, is still evolving. It will continue. It's, uh, it's part of the overall concept of me, which is the, jour it's the journey more than the destination. Um, and a journey is open-ended and uh, it always takes, takes me or anybody just uh, in unusual places sometimes. And still though, in, from the standpoint of love, it is in its somewhat invisible and tangible aspect, it is actually very tangible and very visible mm -hmm. when you're in that state of yeah, love just, and able to share it in, in yourself, self-acceptance. And of course, it's a big counter, counter, cornerstone of what we're talking about. That recognition of unconditional love begins within ourselves. And mm -hmm. then from that, as we have that, we express it. You know. Yeah, and when when a person arrives in that state of being, then everything around them shifts to adjust to it, uh, because it's also a perspective. It's not only how the world looks at you, but how you look at the world. If you look at it through the perspective of uh, unconditional love, you see things differently than if you look at it as duality or not love, uh, fear. If you're looking at it, especially from fear, you see things that are fearful. Right. And uh, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it, uh, it determines our journey. It determines our experience. It determines um, who we are, how we feel about ourselves. Yeah. So it's, it places you in a, a different, as you say, perspective, but really a different vibrational state. Right. When we are, shall we say, not conscious of love, or say we're conscious of 
a limited love, something that we just bantered around because of the way culture kind of dictates the definition of love. When we haven't understood or even contemplate or consider unconditional love, we really are not alive fully in the moment. Yet when we start to understand that this love resides within ourselves and we can expand it, it takes everything to new open awareness. Mm -hmm. So in its evolving state, obviously I posed this question to you when we visited last year, and you've been sitting with the question, and I would imagine in sitting with the question you've also perhaps looked over the entire journey of your life where you had no concept of love, or extraordinarily limited, you know, maybe physiological love, or expectational love, what have you, that, that we are most conditioned to have. Um, could you kind of maybe share with us how your own journey of love went from uh, more or less lack of awareness of love, its potential, its presence, to now that you've even been asked the question and have come to an, an awareness? Give us a bit of an understanding of how love has transformed over your life. Yeah, I have to go back a ways. <laughs> but it, it's uh, not understanding it, not embracing it, uh, is limiting, that you can only go so far, that uh, you don't have the freedom uh, that you do with kind of an unlimited uh, source of love. It, uh, and we, most of us live in that, that limitation, and the limitation is based on fear, and uh, for me, for many years, is what would people think, or what am I supposed to do? Uh, what are, you know, shooting on myself, what should I do mm -hmm. and to make everybody happy, but uh, I had to step out of that and get to the point where uh, what does it think of me is none of my business, which was a very powerful book title by the way. <laughs> uh, and reaching that point, that's when I made some, some major course corrections in my life. And it, I didn't realize that's what I was doing until you know, from retrospect, because 2020 hindsight is still the clearest vision we have. Right. But yeah, and that took my journey off into a very different direction. And would you say that was, in a way, its own version of the catalyst to make you become more aware of the power of love being present in you, and that you could actually, you know, first and foremost claim it for yourself and realize that you have. Uh, it's not even a right, it's, it's not a gift or anything, but a, a natural state of love that yeah. when you actually allow it to begin to flow, it begins to permeate every aspect of your life, and particularly in your case, it permeated it in very interesting ways, very interesting opportunities to actually expand your reality from a very fairly narrowly defined reality from what we understand to a much broader, um, much more creative, much more open field yeah. of reality. It's accessing that field, that um, which is a completely different field from the duality fields of limitation, um, belief systems that keep us in that limitation, and stepping outside of that to a wider perspective. Well, it's all of a sudden it's just like walls fall away, mm -hmm. and what shows up then is based on that acceptance and unconditional love, and the other word for love is acceptance unconditionally accepting, okay, this is the way it is, you know, I, not even having a preference to, I would like it to be something else, because unconditional is also non-preferential, right. which is um, tough for people to wrap their head around sometimes, you know, it's, I, I prefer this instead of that, okay, sure, it's just a choice, it's a discernment, one isn't, uh, Maybe one works for you better, one choice, than the other, and it's, but not, it isn't a case of one is right or wrong. That's duality. But discernment is just making a choice of all the possibilities that are out there that work best. And in our cases, as we've come to understand that because love, it really starts within. Yeah. And it's the, the film project that we're working on is Love Begins With Me. It's the recognition that we turn our, our focus inwardly and we recognize all of our power, all of our potential, all of our, our thoughts, hopes, dreams, desires, and perhaps, you know, for a few of us that are fortunate to have done this consciously, that we recognize that our dreams 
however unique they might be, are ours to explore. And we set ourselves on a course because obviously my background was in business and I chose to explore a much greater part of myself as a result of going within and saying, I have other hopes and dreams that are not necessarily the conditions that culture, society, my family, those close around me think I should be. Yeah, the shoulds. So, the shoulds. <laughs> so the exploration of love within yourself, can you, can you, as we said, a catalyst in your lifetime, but it, can you pinpoint aspects of awakening that, that made you become all of a sudden more aware of love? Was it because you actually started to do things that were loving to yourself, genuinely loving to yourself, that, that kind of opened the door of exploration of love? Yeah, it's been an evolutionary process rather than a revolutionary process. I mean, the, um, the change of gender was just the very beginning. That was just a kind of a, <clears throat> instead of going this direction, we just kind of nudge it over slightly. And, of course, you get 15, 16 years down the road, and it's a completely different path. Um, just kind of nudged out of orbit slightly. And uh, so it's constantly unfolding. Can I point to any one particular realization or awareness where I get up one morning and say, oh, okay, this is what it is? Uh, not really. It's, uh, there are times when I get it, when I really get it, going, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, this is, this is what it is. This is where it's supposed to be. Then the next day, maybe not so much. <laughs> it's that constant shift from that unified field right. of unity, oneness, uh, singularity, um, back to duality. And uh, these are on and off switches. You can't live in both, but you can flip back and forth very quickly. Uh, and we often do. Some days that we spend a lot of time in duality, and other days are the moments of the day that we drop into the singularity. And when we do so, then all of a sudden, love pops into being, and uh, we start seeing the world and experiencing the world and feeling the world much differently, and feeling beyond the world. Right, absolutely. Good That's because uh, there's um, more than just this 3D that we always seem to focus. Yeah, on. That's, uh, we're stuck here for a while, and right. uh, let's check it out and see what it, what see what it's like, and uh, getting into and. Hanging out in duality and finding out, okay, this works, this doesn't work, um, and this this feels pretty good, that doesn't feel so good. And learning from that and moving forward, and I think that's kind of part of our, our journey on this planet. That's one of the reasons why we chose to come down here and check it out. Yeah. And, and in creative ways, and I think perhaps one of the things that we've noticed, you know, in, in our evolution of this particular time on the planet is that we aren't always encouraged to explore our heart. We're not always encouraged. I mean, obviously, I chose to make a, a dramatic shift to singularly focus on the awareness of unconditional love, to really explore it in its depths and its many dimensions, and to mm -hmm. understand it. And I can say in my past where I knew nothing of love, I mean, it, again, a word banded around, it, it had no real particular feeling or meaning. Uh, but once I started to open up, it, it made the world richer and more alive and then my experiences not only towards myself and then outwardly towards others you know I shifted my perspective of myself my perspective of others and others perspectives of me shifted so in relation to that that kind of idea of your journey going from that just going along with the game playing the game realizing that you were so much more realizing that you had love within you and that you could first and foremost honor yourself. You've obviously, you know, as you said, it's, a, it's waves and cycles of recognizing it and not. What have been some of the experiences, say, with those around you as you've gone through this transformation, as you've shifted your perspectives, how have you seen other people differently? And then in turn, how have the responses of others been towards you? Yeah, that's... What happens is the, the people who are in my circle, uh, um, they shift. The, I, um, we draw people to us who are like us, who kind of resonate and vibrate on the same level, and that's open up all over the place. And others just kind of fall away, drop away. Um, and without any confrontation on that part, 
um, or, or with minimum confrontation, uh, lots of times that, that shift happens. We just we draw into our field people who vibrate on that same level, and uh, or we can stay in fear and, and fight it. It's it's uh, resistance is part of it. And we resist uh, those who are around us, um, who see the world differently, have different definitions, uh, things like that. Then uh, if we give that resistance, or if we try to drag them kicking and screaming into the 21st century, we run into problems. It, uh, it, because it's back in that old energy. So, um, what was the song from last year, Let It Go? Yes. Yeah. And that resistance, I think, is one of the biggest, the biggest hurdles most of us have getting out of uh, duality into unconditional love. We have to, we have to let go of trying to bring people along, or trying to fight against people, or um, just to more or less react with equanimity. Like, okay, that's interesting. That's fine. I, I can choose to go that direction, or I can just go someplace else. And well, would you say that that you know was equanimity a part of your understanding in your earlier part of your life, or were you really one that loved conflict and, and, and experienced a lot of conflict? Or I avoided conflict. I constantly did. I was usually a, um, wasn't exactly the peacemaker, but I was the the one who just you know I, in the fight or flight. It was flight, <laughs> and it still is. But even with a uh, deeper understanding what that means, it's not running away from something, it's just stepping out of that, um, that nasty energy field into a more, into more accepting, loving, embracing, higher vibration. Uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, can, can we say in a way that when you became at peace with you and yourself and your truth, that equanimity became more tangibly a part of your understanding. Yeah. But then again, because we, we love begins with me, part of our uh, sharing of understanding is that we recognize that the outer world changes as we shift first and foremost within. Very so we have all these experiences, but the, the awareness is again the hindsight. It was we're looking yeah. through the rearview mirror. It all makes sense now, but at the time we had to make some very difficult choices and some very challenging choices to really own our own truth, to really own our heartfelt understanding, whatever that may be. Yeah, and for me it was stepping out of being the martyr. Uh, you know, I grew up in, in a church, Catholic church, where martyrs were celebrated. Those who beat themselves up for other people. Um, and that, uh, somewhere along the line, there was a realization that isn't working. That, um, trying to elicit pity out of somebody else because of you know worked so hard or I've, uh, I've martyred myself for a particular reason okay that that just didn't work and uh, again it's a looking in hindsight to find okay somewhere along the line I realized that um, pointing to specific moments sometimes is a little difficult when did I even know what equanimity was um, and actually that word came into the vocabulary from a friend from just a few months ago and when she her observation of me was uh, uh, that I respond with equanimity to situations that could be very divisive and very um, fraught with negative energy okay well, I like that word I'll embrace it and um, so I'm fascinated with the idea of realizations that our learning comes from realizations or awarenesses or epiphanies, some of them huge and some of them just kind of little course adjustments. It comes back to our, our theme song of last year, yeah. which was Let It Go, because in, in yeah. these epiphanies, these uh, revelations, these internal awakenings really are when we, in a sense, let down our guard or, or mm -hmm. set aside our belief for a moment mm -hmm. that something has to be one way or the other. And in that the night sleep or in the shower, when we're not thinking about anything else. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's when they usually come through. The, the the most profound little snippets of life that give us a complete different course direction, as you call it. Yeah, and I, I give my best. Uh, I give my best lectures and biggest awarenesses in my morning coffee. <laughs> Sitting there and just all of a sudden I'm, I'm gone someplace. And, and I also write every morning. Must be some strong coffee. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. Um, 
the idea that trying not to hold on to old belief systems. Um, or doing everything the way it's always been done. Yeah. Right? Simply allowing ourselves, not even trying to figure it out perhaps, but yeah. allowing ourselves the opportunity that something more can yeah. actually exist in this moment. Yeah, and, and to, to, to let go of old ideas and old beliefs. Um, we are raised in this culture with uh, belief systems that we need to adhere to. And I think the people with the most conflict, the most stress, the most problems and so forth are those who hang on to very rigid belief systems. Like, uh, we can't change what we believe. Uh, we've got this box, and if it's outside the box, it's wrong. If it's inside the box, it's, it's right and good. And uh, with these, this constant duality of right and wrong and good and evil and um, friend and enemy, uh, uh, to a point where I see a lot of people who can't even think outside the box. If somebody comes at them with an idea that may not fit their already religious belief system, such as a religion, uh, then they can't hear it. They can't. The brain can't physically process it. It just. It just doesn't exist. I could be talking Swahili or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, so, the shift from one energy to the other is coming out of rigidity into flexibility and fluidity. The idea that uh, there's so much more out there. Um, my favorite. Well, Shakespeare quote is from Hamlet, uh, Act Two. You know there are more things in heaven and earth, my dear Horatio, that can be dreamt of in your philosophy. You know, it's many years Which does pose a, a question that I've, I've wondered: um, since you have a long <coughs> teaching career, which, and if it's all right, you happen to be in a field where creativity was actually part of the teaching, so you were <coughs> given an area where you were actually able to not always be inside the box, but teaching as a general rule has a tendency to kind of perpetuate the belief systems or perpetuate, you know, the part of the teaching method, but in your case, your, your teaching kind of gave you that structure, but something still nudged you from within, so there was still an intuitive, there was still a, an inner, an inner quiet voice that was always Say gnawing at you that said you know there's even more beyond and I mean, yeah. I'm talking about reference you you were already kind of outside the box because of the music field yeah. and everything well, very much but so, yeah. beyond that there was even more calling to you because obviously your upbringing in Catholic and all those those you were in a lot of structured environment and yet something said you know I've got to be me I've got to be mm -hmm. you know me on every level every fiber of my being I've got to be the explorer that I am which really in, in the perfect way is that the best teacher is the student you know you were you became oh, of course, a student yeah. of life <laughs> while you were in the process of teaching but how did that structure help you in that in a way how did it hinder you could could you have moved faster had that structure not been there or was it just going to happen the way it needed to happen? Uh, I think it needed, happened the way it needed to happen. Um, there was very a right often, maturity time for you, maybe? Yeah, it's a, everything happens at the right time kind of thing. That's a, uh, why is everything wait till the last minute? Because it doesn't have to happen before the last minute. And uh, that was one of the things I had to learn, that it's okay to wait till the last minute. As long as you didn't wait past the last minute, that's when you got into problems. But uh, I was never a type A personality that had to get it done right now. And uh, I know I would, uh, there are times when I would have loved to have been able to transition much, much younger. But when I look back at it, again with that 2020 hindsight, okay, it was the perfect time. Uh, for a lot of physical reasons, uh, situations around me, plus also, it was the right time here, right. and that uh, constant go within. Ask yourself the question, and then just sit with the, sit, wait for the answer. I think we we are taught uh, in our school systems and in our institutions and churches, and so forth, not to trust ourselves, not to trust our instincts. Very uh, kids are born with very good intuition, very good instincts, and we usually beat that out of them before they get into the first grade. Absolutely. <laughs> Plus a lot of creativity is gone at that point too. Um, and we get, I, I could never go back into um, traditional education right now, because I just have, I see it too restrictive. 
And again, uh, it can only be analyzed in, in, the, in retrospect, going back. Um, did, I, did I realize at the time I was realizing um, what I was realizing? And probably that question is no. <laughs> sure. Like, uh, okay, that, that's interesting. Where did that come from kind of thing? But yeah, that uh, the kingdom of heaven is within. Um, it's constantly going in and asking ourselves questions. And I kept, I kept that at bay by becoming a workaholic. I mean, I... So you I avoided was, yourself. Oh, yeah, I avoided myself. I avoided a lot of things at that, um, constantly through my life until I got to a point where it was sort of pointed out with me, okay, you need to change. And because it was at the right time, everything around me fell into place to help support that change. So um, you didn't, you, in a way, in hindsight, you say you, you realize that a part of you could have forced it sooner, and mm -hmm. in other ways, by allowing it to happen in its own organic timing, everything else around you lined up. So it, it, again, mm -hmm. it comes back to our love begins with me. I would say in hindsight, we could look at your life and say, <laughs> as you became more comfortable with all of it, everything around you lined up simultaneously to be more comfortable with it. Yeah. Particularly, your, your story is one of great love, great compassion, great support, certainly more so than most. And it's a powerful message because we are inculcated and indoctrinated and infused and subjected to drama and negativity ad nauseum. Yeah. And so we only, only are told the conflicted stories. The, the horror stories, the drama stories, but in fact there are lots of loving ways to experience life, and they have their trials and tribulations, we yeah. don't discount that, but we do recognize that when you're more at peace in an equanimity, in an unconditional love, that everything that comes back vibrates with that and essentially reflects that. It's when yeah. we're at conflict that we tend to draw more. Yeah, my, one of my favorite questions is, uh, is the world out to get you or is the world out to support you? And whichever um, one you choose, is that's what shows up. And uh, so the power of perspective in that. Oh yeah. So this is that love piece that I say. The power of knowing of love, that you are love, that it's not something you have to do. It's something you already are. Yeah. Um, you are actually then creating in your in your canvas more love. Not to say that there aren't the moments where we we don't need the contrast in order to. <laughs> Yeah. To deepen our, our to sense of love. The, to see the shadows in order to understand the light. And, and the other thing is we are, we are shifting in culture, and there's a lot of cultural beliefs that we're not even kind of aware of. Um, one of them is that there has to be pain and suffering to gain anything, that, that Protestant work ethic kind of thing, and that's nothing is gained uh, uh, without fighting, you know. Freedom isn't free and all those kinds of things, but what if it was? What? You know, what is the opposite of that? Well, uh, this is about, yeah, about 10 years ago, the uh, phrase popped into my head, um, with ease and grace, let it be in place. And that's been my prayer and my kind of guiding from here on in. Why does it have to be hard? Why does it have to be, uh, it's again that martyr thing. I've paid my dues, I, get, I deserve. Well, what happens if we just deserve because we are? Right. Um, we're worthy because we are, and it doesn't have to be pain and suffering to get there. And I and I see that so many people are still back in that old thought. Like you got to work really hard. She works hard for the money, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Well, why not? Why is that? And why can't we go into a different a different vibration with that? And we are. We are very much. In some of our previous conversations, you know, we've talked about this martyr energy, this victim energy, this this singularly sing, singling ourselves out with a label, or singling ourselves out to be part of a label. Yeah. And yet, like in your case, you know, as you said, you went from this point of the journey, and you just nudged it over a little bit. Your journey of who you are really had nothing to do with anything other than you just simply decided to explore more of you this way. Mm. And a natural way, in, yeah. way in your case, and in that flow, did you find that when you kind of stopped feeling like a martyr or victim, that 
that again your whole psyche really shifted in the sense that you didn't need to play the game because in some ways the martyr victim was really protecting an egoic state or was protecting yeah. a personality or, or protecting the status quo but when you actually simply let go yeah. and, and simply just allowed yourself to be that in that being kind of in a way, shall we say, almost metaphorically, symbolically, that love lifted you up, <laughs> if you wanted to call it <laughs> that. But, but essentially, love, love became a prominent part, and then, as you've said several times in this conversation, that so many things just dissolved, and you can't say when, or they, they yeah. appeared, and you can't say when. Would, would you say yeah, that's part of the aspect yeah. of love? That yeah, that the older energies are going, okay, whatever. I wonder whatever happened to that. What's, you almost... Uh, reach a point where you uh, remember it. It just uh, becomes uh, significant, insignificant, yeah. Well, I've had the opportunity to you know, read a variety of books and, and endorse some books and stuff on a variety of subjects, this being one of them, and there's still kind of a sense where in, in that victim energy, and part of why we're sharing the more positive sides, the, the, the moral of the story, the how we gone with our lives to be ourselves in whatever way, shape, form that is for us. Um, you know, in, in your experience, because you've worked a lot in the creative arts, you've encountered lots of different personalities and, and energies. Um, you were, <laughs> the old ways, oh, you were fortunate to wake up. Well, that's not really true. Everybody has it within them. And I think that's the point of our conversation. Mm -hmm. It is there. It's simply recognizing that it is there and allowing that to come forth. Or, I would also imagine that you've seen a lot of uh, individuals who have made their own transformations in life, whatever way, shape that was, but they really never learned to let go of that, that martyrdom or that victim or that, that old rigid belief system and that they actually perpetuate their journey and they just keep flogging a dead horse, they keep beating that drum mm -hmm. to, to the, an endless unhappy reality. Yeah, and they're also stuck in this uh, trying to change the world out there first, you know, um, getting people to the point where they, uh, getting others to change their mind. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't get anybody to change their mind. You can only change yourself, and then the world shifts to the, to accommodate. You be yourself. Yeah, and in in that sense, I mean. In the, again, in, in your earlier parts of your life, you were being the only self you knew to be, and so everything accommodated it. Mm -hmm. And now you're being the greater aspect of who you really are, and it's all being accommodated. Yeah. Would you have any insights or, I don't know, say, suggestions for those that are are recognizing that they keep holding on to the old? That you know, what what does it mean, in other words, for you to to just Get on with your life. Just be your life. Just be yeah. the love. Just be who you are, and you know you're just you're just as in some ways, ironically, back to being everybody else. But <laughs> the difference is in you, the the equanimity in you, the unconditional love in you, the the, the self acceptance in you, obviously does make a, a profound difference in the way you actually experience life. Yeah, and I think it's it's part of it is. Uh, a lot of people don't want to go to self-acceptance. They want acceptance from without. Again, we have to accept ourselves first. You, did, did you find you needed a little bit of that too first, just to give you a sense uh, of yeah. confidence? Oh, yeah. That's a, the, the um, what's the word? Validation. Yes. Uh, and lots of times people don't recognize the validation that's there. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't receive the, the compliment yeah. that's being presented to Right, you. right. Uh, and just realizing where validation comes, because we do need the validation to make sure that we're on the right road. You know, as I drive around the country, I need the road signs to make sure that I'm still on, still on the right highway, especially in New England, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, yeah, but do we recognize those signs? And uh, do we, we, again, it's a cultural belief system that we have to have it from outside. Everything has to come from outside. But if we get inside, okay, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm here. I'm, a, I accept myself. This, this is great. I like being me. I love being me. Me is cool. And then just kind of sit in that and allow that to go on out instead of, and allow it time. 
instead of, okay, I'm me, I'm cool, and so forth. Now everybody else... Mirror that, please. Yeah, mirror yeah. that right now. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a process. You have to just kind of, things drop off and new things come on. It's, it's, it's not quite an on and off switch. It's, although there is the on and off switch of getting into new loving energy, unified field energy, rather than staying in the old fear-based duality, but, and we move back and forth until we reach that, uh, that new energy, that higher vibrational energy, and that becomes our knee-jerk response. Um, kind of our plateau where we, we now have yeah. settled at a higher vibration, and, and, and in that equanimity, yeah. we are not as easily challenged or dropped down into yeah. negative vibrations or fearful vibrations because we have a quicker recovery time of recognizing that, that equanimity. Yeah, what's our knee jerk? Right. You know, uh, we can, and this is something that I've been um, kind of becoming more and more aware of. What's my knee jerk response to this? Is it judgmental? There are some things that I still need your judgment mm -hmm. for. Um, okay, how, and this is a question I've been sitting in of late. How do I change that? What do I, you know, where do I go to shift the, change my knee jerk? So it comes from a field of love rather than a field of fear. And what is the response? Any response yet to share? <laughs> <laughs> Working on it, yeah. No, that's right. The, that question is fairly recent. Um, okay, what, how do I change my knee jerk? Perhaps just being aware that you have yeah, it, obviously, that's that allows you a choice. The first, uh, that's the big piece of it. Okay, I just, I just went there. And drop it, let it go, move to the other place. It's, 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 a, it's habitual. You have to rewire your consciousness and your brain to start, uh, right? Re reprogram ourselves in the new vibration, reprogram yeah. ourselves in the new understanding mm -hmm. that, that it includes love and is supposed to completely oblivious to mm -hmm. love. Yeah. Uh, given a person with road rage, always, so when somebody cuts them off immediately, it's the reaction, it's the negative kind of going there and realizing maybe that isn't, sh that isn't the best way. Right. Um, realize that they're fighting traffic rather than being traffic. Uh, and you put a lot of miles on to really hone that Yeah, story. yeah, and, and realizing that that's part of the singularity. We're no longer, um, this was just something that came to me this morning, um, that we are no longer a driver in a car. Once we get on the road, we are a cell in a larger being called traffic. And when we realize that, we arrive safely and on time and everything else, and with, with less stress, but so many of us go onto the road in that duality. It's me against everybody else on the road. Well, we're generally in the head. We're generally in the duality yeah. ourselves. And yeah. so, of course, the, the road is just one place we get to play it out in a yeah. <laughs> fashion at times. Yes. And have, we're enclosed inside of cars so we can call And, and at times we feel powerful because we feel yeah. we have you know, something bigger than us that can you know, yeah, do damage. Yeah, it's a by a truck. <laughs> <laughs> Real well, check. You have told us in the past, we've mentioned in this, one of the things that you do really on a daily basis is journaling or writing out, especially in the morning. Have you always done that? Like, did, or is that something that you've picked up on? Uh, how does that bring through some of these awarenesses? How does it help you to okay. formulate an understanding? How I got there with this is a, a book called The Artist's Way by Julia mm -hmm. Cameron. Book. Yep. Awesome. And uh, one of the exercises that she had um, suggested in there was do your morning pages. Which you, it's basically just write three pages of uh, stream of consciousness, whatever comes out of the end of the pen. Um, and uh, you do that as soon as you get up in the morning. Well, that didn't quite work for me. I still need the coffee. So uh, I started, when I was doing this, I, I started getting out and going to a coffee house out of my, out of my home element. To, and it also, because I was unemployed at the time, it got me out of the house. And I would get the cheapest cup of coffee that would refillable and uh, just start writing the pages. I now, this month, have been doing that for 10 years. Okay. And it's evolved and moved different ways. It's no longer functioning exactly as she was using, the tool she was using. It's, it's a journaling and it's a ritual. And that's where a lot of the stuff come out. Um, I'll just start writing, I'll, you know, and uh, it's kind of a little bit of chronicling. The first paragraph will be about uh, 
you know, what I'm doing or where I always, and since I've been on my rabbit hole journey, I always put down what coffee house I'm in and which town, so I can re reference it back and date all these things. And now I've got binders and binders, and I really should go back and read them sometime. I can't quite do that. I've tried it. Uh, it's not time yet. And or it was a, it was it was what it was when it was. Yeah, and it now you are who yeah, you are it's, now. It's changed, and not a lot of things come out. It's uh, I you know people ask me, are you working on a book? Uh, well, I'm, I have this imaginary book, <laughs> and if it binders full of imaginary, yeah, books, it's, apparently it's, it's. And what's the subject? Well, I, that'll change from day to day too. Uh, or I, I would would have a hard time with memoirs because uh, that I, I'm looking at the past through the eyes of today, and some of it some of it just kind of evaporates and disappears, um, and doesn't make sense. So, uh, yeah, that uh, data, it's my former journaling, and yet a way for you to, in essence, become more conscious of your own evolutionary pattern, even if you can't string together all of the data, yeah. you, you're actually, in a way, giving evidence of what's happening in your sleep and in your shower and in your coffee and your yeah. all the other and moments where you're getting the epiphanies and the understandings. And it slows it down and puts it yeah, on the page. Yeah, it, uh, when I start writing a paragraph, I'm going to have to finish through because I, uh, the general, you know, the shower and the coffee and the kind of thing, I, I interrupt myself a lot. <laughs> Constantly, okay, I'm thinking about, you know, I never get around back to where I started. Mm -hmm. Well, almost ever. But uh, it, when I'm writing, I tend to formalize it a lot more. And uh, things, things will come out of it because I'm also slowed down in, as fast as I can write. Um, so, yeah, journaling has been very important in that form for me. For others, it's... Uh, I tried journaling just regularly, carrying the book mm -hmm. and write down thoughts when, and it, that didn't work either. But having a specific time where I sit down and do this, okay, that's that's worked. And we all need ritual, right? And in some way to, to care, in a way keep ourselves focused on our own journey, become mm -hmm. you know ever mindful is probably another way of saying being being aware of, of our own day to day process. And, yeah, and I know journaling has been a powerful point. I'm going to do a little bit of segue um, from that particular part of the subject, but you're also a parent, mm -hmm. you're a sibling, because mm -hmm. you've got you know, brothers and sisters, and you Don't yourself... Don't grandparent. And, well, and, yes, that's, that's the <laughs> grandparent in it, and you obviously were the child of parents who are deceased now. Um, again, we're kind of before, during, after, or, you know, the, the evolutionary cycle of awareness of, or non-awareness of anything, but living kind of life unconsciously, um, and then just waking up and becoming more conscious, and particularly becoming more conscious of the self-acceptance, the self-love, the self-awareness, and that you can look at the world through the heart of equanimity. I would imagine, you know, in the realm of your world, that shift of perspective had an impact on your parents when they were alive. It probably had an impact, an ongoing evolutionary impact on your siblings. Mm -hmm. And then very particularly your own children and grandchildren, um, who would be probably, particularly grandchildren, would be more of the space of your now aware of love. So I'm sure you, you as a good grandparent, treat them differently anyway than you do your own kids. Um, but how has your immediate family, your, your, again, kind of, you looking out at your immediate family in the various levels, and then the response of the family, now that you've infused love as your perspective. Oh. I am very fortunate and blessed because my family is still with me. I mean, it's, they, they have not completely rejected me, but it did change relationships all the way along. Um, some, and whether it improved or um, went the other direction, that's a judgment call. It just shifted and changed. And it's still, um, it's still evolving. Like, um, even um, notwithstanding the event of my gender transition, uh, my kids as high school kids when I was parenting them and how they are now as adults is a completely different relationship. I kind of like them as adults because 
and I can they, then I can carry on different better conversations with them and so forth. But yeah, when a person changes, one of the first things I had to realize when, when it's a major change, like a gender transition or coming out of the closet or something like that, then everybody has to shift, and some shift away, some shift closer. Uh, with um, with friends, it became some a lot of them became much closer uh, because the the wall of secrecy was down. And others just drifted away. Uh, and most of them just drifted. Some of them had to take a couple of shots on the way out the door, kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it does. It does. It does change into just just relationships. And we are all part of relationships, or not? That's part of the new uh, new energy. That's part of love. It's not independent. It's not. It's. We're all interconnected. And interconnected. Yeah, all interconnected, interrelated, and um, moving together. And 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 in an interrelationship, when one thing changes over here, everything shifts over here. It's uh, you can see that with the death in the family or a divorce or something like that. Then everything slightly adjusts, and depending upon the level of consciousness and love within the people in that greater relationship. It depends upon if it adjusts closer or further or just changes colors. And in your case, just simply you, even having a, a, for any of us, a bare understanding of unconditional love, but just conceptualizing the idea of unconditional love, I would assume that as you're describing this, that your ability to relate to family members and friends as they make their adjustments, if you're not attached to the validation or the acceptance or any of those things, the fact that you understand unconditional love for yourself, it, I would say that it allows then for you to, to look at the family members and let them be where they are, let them be at the level of acceptance that they are, let them be at the level of understanding, mm -hmm. and that you move on your life anyway, but rather than trying to force understanding or force acceptance or force rejection or force yeah. whatever, uh, Obviously, your approach, and that, that's what has inspired me so much with your journey, is that your dedicated approach with unconditional love, whether you, whether you knew it as that terminology or not, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 faced it, you faced your journey with that essential understanding inside, and then addressed it with all those around you, and, and essentially by doing it that way, by using the self-acceptance, self-love, self-awareness, self-understanding, just being conscious on your path to the best of your ability, you also gave many, many, many people the opportunity to see that reflection and then choose it of themselves. And, and as you say, many did as a result, and, and the few didn't. And that's okay too, but I, I would say that you know, historically and culturally, it's usually the reverse because most people are coming from fear, coming from loathing, coming from lack of any self-acceptance, self-worth, and, and of course that's what they then have a tendency to experience so much more of around them. And really here we're trying to show, or we are sharing actually, not even trying to show, we're showing the evidence of what happens when you infuse the love piece and then allow people that, that opportunity to love and let them be at that level of love. Yeah, and the, the choice is then theirs. Um, the old victim energy is, uh, I want you to accept me. You know, uh, without it, I, I, you know, it, without your acceptance, then I am less than. I, it hurts me. It's painful and so forth. And uh, and I've seen that over and over again. That uh, you know, my family won't accept me. My friends won't accept me. My church won't accept me, and all that kind of thing. Well, um, what have you done to create that acceptance in others? Well, the first thing is to accept yourself. Uh, and not make you, the acceptance of self depend upon the acceptance of others. And the other... Which uh, actually brings you the very thing you're really looking for. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, it's part of the life there. irony, you know, it's like by, by letting it be, you get essentially exactly what you really want, but when you're constantly at, at yeah. odds with it, you keep pushing it away. Yeah, and the, the, and the willingness to allow it to go away. That's, that was the tough part. I, I had reached a point where I was willing to lose my job, my friends, my family, everything. Uh, just and as soon as I could release it, okay, I can. I will still somehow survive. 
if I lose all of that thing, well, fortunately, I didn't lose any of it. Uh, but the willingness to lose is a big piece of that letting go. And uh, when we, we, in order to do that, we have to be able to go inside. And you know, I don't didn't realize that at the time. It was just part of okay. This is what I got to do. You know, the instincts were taking me. Okay, this is the time. This is this is this is where I got to go. This is what I got to do. And uh, and it doesn't depend upon others. But uh, so much in the old victim mentality is that I, I can't love myself unless you love me. Mm -hmm. I can't accept myself and you unless you accept me. So therefore, I demand acceptance. Right. Uh, Which is, of course, very conditional yeah, in that direction yeah, because it's, it's a like very conditional way of getting Yeah, and it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. But just to, it's hard in coaching others because you can't just explain that that doesn't work. It's got to be well, somehow understood. And, and become experiential to them, wherever mm -hmm. that may be. And that's part of our sharing here is to show that the experiential part is always sitting there waiting to reveal itself. Yeah. And it really comes down to the more we can allow ourselves to just be and be in the moment and be in our presence and be in our love. And, and again, this is a, a very undefinable, you know, universal <laughs> understanding of love. So we, we don't even try to put, you know, labels or we give it a, a connotation because I think people do recognize, you know, when we're talking about a love that has no conditions, truly no conditions, that does take us to a different plane of understanding. Mm -hmm. And it's not trying to resolve the duality. Unconditional love doesn't sit in duality. It sits in, through, and around all of it, and is part of none of it. And, yeah. and that's why people say, give it a definition. It's, well, I, I have a definition, but, you know, the experience of it is where the profundity comes. And it's very sublime in its own right in the sense that, you know, it just is what it is. Yeah, it's a feeling rather than an understanding. And the feeling leads to the understanding. Yeah. So the journey has taken you in all different types of directions. And it's brought you to this particular moment. Yeah, I've been making this up as I go along. Absolutely. <laughs> we don't want Is there anything you would like to leave the audience with as a, as a, a feeling for yourself? Of I mean, you know, we could say, well, you know, if you had to do it over again, well, would you have done it differently? Well, we go through all those cliches. Well, we've covered that. It wasn't the right yeah. time or right moment. But Certainly, in your instance, you know, the, one can say the alternative was to not face that victim, not face that martyr, not face that fear, not face that nudge, and simply, in a way, go into oblivion. It would have been, you know, family, and you would have just coasted into a reality, but you, you made a choice, it was a conscious choice, and I think in that conscious choice, it wasn't something that happened to you, it was a conscious realization, acceptance of who you already are. And that yeah. conscious thing is really where we say is the empowerment, because why wait till it happens to you? You know, do it consciously, but your particular journey being filled with a lot of um, inspiration, you know, you, could you, you know, leave our, our audience with a message of, of um, hey, I'm me, kind the, of thing? The, the moral of the story? The moral of the story? <laughs> well, it, it, it continues as it began with the, it's the journey, not the destination. Um, and that was, a, that was a lesson learned when I began with my morning pages. Um, there was, it was kind of an unformed idea. And again, a lot of what I, who I am and what I am comes with stories. Well, this one was uh, my first theater job in Creed, Colorado. Um, and I was writing my morning pages. And kind of that whole idea was there. And uh, I was in Journey's coffee shop, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the young man who worked for the Mountain Man Sports, the the um, Rio Grande River rafting crew, they had they came in, they had sweatshirts on, and it said on the back of there, "It's the journey, not the destination," which was about whitewater rafting. And we're like, "Okay, I get it," <laughs> and I've sat in that idea since then. Okay, so where's it going to go from here? I don't know. Let's go so, find out. Shall we say right, wrong, up or down, in or yeah, out, yeah, love so. or not, the journey continues. <laughs> to boldly go where no one has gone. Let's see what's out there. Yes. Yeah. So, simply live to the best of our ability yeah. and, and continue uh, on the journey no matter what. 
and sit in the belief uh, that uh, the world's out to support you. Yes. That's always there. And that'll show up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. It's been a real pleasure. We appreciate the opportunity to share Jennifer's journey. <laughs> you know, thank you. <laughs>